Thank you, May Lynn and Kim and Barb. Um, we're so blessed with our music here. So this morning, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing our speaker, Charlie Heavenrich. I first met Charlie in 2004 when Mark and I went on a trip with Mile High Church hiking and rafting the Grand Canyon. And Charlie was one of our guides. We were so inspired that we went a second time two years later. Charlie was my life coach for several years, and um, he would ask me questions that would make me sweat. <laughs> uh, and he would also ask me questions that would expand my consciousness and open my heart. And now Charlie has evolved into a, a dear and beloved friend. So in addition to being a breakthrough life coach and inspiring adventure speaker, Charlie has authored two books, Dancing on the Edge and Unimagined Gifts, both a wonderful read. Um, he's also a photographer and producer of a DVD slideshow, Spirit of the Canyon. And by the way, all of these will be available after the service and after his workshop, which he'll be telling you more about here later. So please help me give Charlie a warm welcome. We're going to welcome Colorado's most eligible bachelor, the awesome Charlie Heavenrich. <laughs> Let's all take a deep collective breath. What would you choose to do? How might your life be if you were not afraid? Mark my words, we're all afraid at times. So, feel the fear and do it anyway because the only way out is through and that is your door and your path to freedom. Let's look at Marilyn's example of her experience. Marilyn was a tall, slim, very pleasant woman. She came to the canyon to celebrate her 30th wedding anniversary. She brought her best friend, Carol, because her husband just wasn't into group things. This trip was in September, and it was a hiker special. And on day 11, we hiked into an incredibly magical place called the patio at Deer Creek. We spent several hours just hanging out, you know, limestone slabs with water running through the middle and this incredible shade prevented, presented by these massive cottonwood trees. And as we were getting ready to head back to the rafts, Carol came up to me and said, you know, Marilyn is afraid of heights. She had a really hard time coming in in that very narrow stretch. Would you be willing to help her get back, back through there? Marilyn was only too happy to accept the support. And so as we started to walk, I said two things. First, Marilyn, when you take a step, imagine that the bottom of your feet are massaging the skin of the earth. And if you should get into fear, Stop where you are and breathe. Fear takes us out of our body, puts us in our head. Breathing will bring us back down into our body so that we can reconnect. So we walked along this narrow gorge, sensuous, 570 million year old peat sandstone. At first we could see the creek in the gorge, but eventually it had carved so deep that we couldn't see it. And as we approached that narrow spot, Marilyn slowed down, and finally she stopped, frozen in fear. She faced as close to the wall as she could, her toes touching the wall, her heels literally in air. And all she could hear was the roar of that creek 100 feet below. Eventually, she talked to herself, breathe, Marilyn, 
breathe. Breathe, Marilyn. Breathe. And then she took one tentative step to her left. Breathe, Marilyn. Breathe. And then another tentative step. And more breathing. And one more step. And then finally, one last step and a big sigh of relief as we came to a wider part of the trail. And then we walked out into the beautiful September sun, went around the corner, and we came to another potential obstacle. It was a rock fall that had been improved by the Park Service, and both Marilyn and Carol stopped, intimidated by what they saw. So I said two more things. First, this is sandstone. It's kind of like stair steps. It just happens to be not 90 degree angle stair steps. And sandstone is like walking on sandpaper. So trust your feet and trust the stone. And then I talked to them about the lesson of the bighorn sheep. When the bighorn move, they start on a stable platform and they move till they find another stable platform. And if they should misstep, they just take another step. They use momentum. What do humans do when they take a misstep? They usually stop and try to catch their balance rather than using the momentum. And then I demonstrated it step, step, step. And Carol seemed to pick up on it very quickly. And then Marilyn started to take her first halting step. And she did what she had always done on every other hike. She started to bend her knees and lean down and reach for something secure. And I said to her, Marilyn, you have the strength and you have the balance. You're strong enough. You can do this. And she froze in this position and tears formed in her eyes. And she said, no one has ever told me I was strong enough. And then she straightened up and at first with some hesitation, but by the time we got down to the bottom of that trail, she was moving with a lot more freedom and a lot more confidence. We'll all experience fear from time to time. Have you ever said yes when you really wanted to say no? That's the fear of telling the truth. Or maybe it's the fear of heights or the fear of water or the fear of traffic, or maybe it's just the fear of showing up, being fully present and passionate in who you are. Dr. Wayne Dyer describes, defines actually fear as an emotion that immobilizes you in the present over something that may or may not happen in the future. That's precisely the experience that John had on his 1982 Grand Canyon trip. This was a research trip with several well-known scientists. John was a grad student in geology. He'd never been west of the Alleghenies. And here he was in this living geologic museum, the Grand Canyon, surrounded by, enfolded in rocks that were 240 million to 1.84 billion years old. Rocks that he had only seen or read about in his geology books. This is how John looked most of the time. <laughs> John was in heaven. Until we got to Hans Rapid, that is. Hans is the first of the major rapids at mile 77 in the Grand Canyon. We pulled over above it on the left, hiked up a boulder-strewn sand dune to scout the rapid to see about our run. As soon as John saw the rapid, he turned around sat down on a big boulder. Fifteen minutes later, we're heading back to the rafts, and I came to John, and you know, he was pale. Pale is not normal in the desert. <laughs> John was scared. He had just spent the last 15 minutes listening to the freight train, looking at nothing but white water and rocks, convinced he was going to die. So, in an attempt to take his mind off his impending doom, I said, John, you're a scientist. You're, you're good at detail, right? Yeah, I guess. So how would you like to help me get through this rapid 
safely. How? Well, let me, let me tell you what the run is going to be. There's a lot of markers. This is a fairly technical rapid. You can help me keep track of those markers. What do you think? Well, I'll try. So I described the run. I showed him that we were going to row across the river, turn the boat around facing the back towards the left shore. We're going to run, move down the tongue and break through on the left side, grab some slack water, attempt to get left of what we call the goal posts, which are rocks, water pouring over them, creating a couple of holes or depressions behind there. Keep pulling left, find what we call the whale rock, which is a huge pour over. Whale was a motorboat guide who got stuck on there for a whole day one year. See if we can get left of the whale rock, and if not, find a slot between two big holes to the right and hit some big waves straight. Well, John was looking intensely. He said, tell me again. So I went through the run one more time, and then he went, okay. And we walked back to the rafts. We got back to the rafts. By then, John's color was back in his face. He hopped on the raft. I untied the bow line, coiled it up, attached it to the bow, and then we shoved off. And we rowed across the river, turned the boat around. John is so focused on the entry. The current's moving really slowly until we get right to the head of the rapid. Then it speeds up and all hell breaks loose. That's when John got excited. He said, there you go, Charlie, you're doing great. Now you got to break through that left side here. Yeah, grab that slack water. Oh yeah, that's good, that's good. Now we got to get to the left. We're not going to get to the left of the goalpost, Charlie. You better get in the middle of it. Yep, there you go. Wow, look at the size of that hole. Now, now we got to find the whale well rock. Uh, yeah, there it is down there. You're not getting left of that, Charlie. You got to go right. Oh my God, look at the size of those holes. Charlie, you got to get that slot. Hit those waves straight. Oh, great run. John was so excited, I had to remind him that we still had more rapids to run. <laughs> now, the irony is that John felt fear when he had that stable terra firma underneath his feet. And he had no fear in the middle of where all the chaos and the potential danger is. You know that you cannot experience fear in this moment? I can hear some of you thinking, right, no fear in the moment. Listen, buddy, I have experienced fear, and it's been very much in the moment. And I can understand how you would feel that way, but think about it. Fear, as Wayne Dyer says, is of a future event. It could be the next instant, or it could be some imagined event somewhere down the road. Fear's always of a future event. So I'll look at Marilyn's experience. Her fear was that she would take that next step and fall. John's fear was because he didn't know how to read water. He didn't see that there was a safe run that was available to him. And both discovered a new sense of freedom when they were willing to face their fears and move through them. Now, freedom is not about eliminating your fears. What we need to do is take a look at the fear. And what I have seen in my last four, 34 years as a raft guide in the Grand Canyon is that when you're willing to operate in the presence of your fear, at the very least, you will diminish the control that fear has over you doing what you really, really want to do. That's certainly what I experienced on my trip, my first trip in 1978. So we're on the last full day. We're after lunch and floating in a fairly calm stretch of the canyon. There is no wind and it is hot. The sun is just draining us of moisture. And because the trip leader didn't want us to get to camp too early and bake in the sun, he had us pull over into an eddy and tie up under, in the shade of some overhanging rocks. It wasn't long before some people were sleeping, some people reading, a few people talking quietly. Then without warning, all six of my crewmates stood up and climbed, started climbing up the rocks. I had no idea what they were up to. But not wanting to miss out on any adventure, I followed arriving at the top, just in time to watch. 
as all six of my crewmates jumped one at a time 35 feet into the river. Now, it's my turn. <laughs> Innocently, I approached the edge. Suddenly, my legs turned to rubber. My gut tightened up. 35 feet. Do you know how far 35 feet looks when it's your turn <laughs> and you've never jumped before? Oh my god, look how far that is. And I've got to get out past the boats. What if I don't make it past the boats? What if I do a belly flop? I'll be hamburger. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're down below. They're smiling. Waiting for me to jump. Come on, Charlie. Come on, buddy. You can do it. <laughs> Come on, jump. I can't move. I can hardly breathe. So I step back from the edge, you know, find my breath, gather my thoughts, decide, do I really want to do this? Do I want to risk humiliation by going back to the rafts or life and limb by jumping? So. I took several deep breaths, finally felt my gut loosen up, and I decided to go for it. Again, innocently, I reapproached the edge, assuming that it was going to look shorter. It looked farther. And they're still down there, but now they're getting impatient. Come on, Charlie, jump! We haven't got all day. Look, either jump or come down. So I jumped. And the instant my feet left the rocks, I wanted them back on the rocks. <laughs> it took less than two seconds. That felt like an eternity before I plunged into the river. Reversing direction, I came out of that river with a huge grin, crawled up on shore, rolled over on my back, and just felt like, wow, 35 feet. I just did that. And then one of my crewmates suggested that I go back up and do it again. <laughs> what? This time she said, don't think so much. Walk up to the edge. Decide where you want to go and jump. And because I respected and trusted her judgment, I did just that. I climbed up, walked to the edge, looked where I wanted to go, and I jumped. And it was much easier the second time. Much easier. And I felt that sense of exhilaration and freedom from not thinking too much. So, how do we go from fear to freedom? Well, we don't ignore the fear, because we've all done that, haven't we? Instead, embrace the fear as an ally and use it to take a look at the situation. Is there real danger here, or is it just what I'm imagining? And then once you have stabilized whatever's causing the danger, mostly it's in our head, but not always, then get away from that mindset of danger and take per personal responsibility for the choice and the freedom of doing what you really, really want to do. Donna is a great example of that. Donna was 61 when she came into the canyon and still suffering from some of the painful reminders of childhood polio. Still, she managed to navigate the seven and a half mile Bright Angel Trail with her 35-year-old fiance. <laughs> Tells you something about Donna. And she was really looking forward to the trip, despite her many well-intentioned friends who managed to tell her all the things that could go wrong on a trip in the Grand Canyon. Some friends. Well, on day six, she was in my raft. We just finished lunch after running Lava Falls, the last major rapid, and the afternoon was going to be calm, pretty peaceful. So as we were floating along, a soft breeze blowing off the water, <clears throat> modifying the desert heat, Donna suddenly shifted places on the raft, plopping herself on the front tube facing downstream. She began to playfully kick her feet in the water, <clears throat> excuse me, humming to herself. Finally, I asked, what are you feeling right now, Donna? She looked over her shoulder, this huge grin on her face, and she said, 
freedom, Charlie. Freedom. Until I came here, I didn't realize how much responsibility I had accepted for everybody else in my life but me. Donna had begun her trip with some concerns about her stamina, burdened by the comments of others. She ended it feeling free. Regardless of the circumstances that may generate fear in your life, you always have the power to choose freedom. I think this is a, a good time to introduce to you a symbol, a symbol that I call the symbol of freedom. We'll talk more about this in the workshop. In the Native Amer American tradition that I studied, we learned from the wheel. The wheel is a circle. There's no hierarchy to it. And what they taught was there's no place on the wheel that's any more important than any other place on the wheel. Yet each place represents a different viewing point. So have you ever felt stuck, trapped in a corner with no choice? Well, here's the good news. No choice is a choice. It's not the choice. It's a choice. So the next time you find yourself looking at your situation and not liking how it looks, how it feels, what's going on, especially if you're feeling stuck, then choose freedom. Walk around the wheel. Create feed freedom through a fresh perspective. Marilyn experienced freedom when she learned to trust her body. John felt both freedom and exhilaration when he was able to be in the moment, even in the most dangerous parts of the rapid. My experience of freedom and exhilaration came when I stopped thinking so much. And Donna found an incredible sense of freedom when she stopped allowing the opinions of others to determine her choices. She took personal responsibility and chose to do what she really, really wanted to do. A shaman once said to me, you've mastered being in the canyon. Now you can master being in the city. So I'm going to invite you to come with me from the Grand Canyon to Manhattan. It's noon in Manhattan, in the canyons of Manhattan, by the way. So imagine noon in Manhattan. All that attendant cacophony, those tires screeching, honk, honking horns, uh, honking horns, <laughs> honking horns, <laughs> and people screaming. Well, there's a Native American and his Anglo friend, and they're walking in the canyons of Manhattan, when all of a sudden the Native American puts a finger to his lips, and he goes, shh, did you hear that? His friend said, hear what? The cricket. Yeah, right. You just heard a cricket. All this noise. And you, where's this cricket? And across the street there in that planter. Yeah, right. I got to see this. Show me the cricket. So they walked across the street. Native American walked up to the planter, started rummaging through all the Throw away styrofoam cups, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the Starbucks, the cigarette butts. And he picks up a cricket, a black cricket. And his friend is incredulous. It's like, that's amazing. How did you do that? Again, he put a finger to his lips, reached into his pocket, pulled out a bunch of coins, held his hand out, opened up his hand, and the coins dropped to the pavement. And 20 people stopped and looked. And then the Native American said, it all depends on where you put your attention. What you put your attention to is what you will experience. If you choose to allow fear to paralyze you, you will be trapped, stuck on that edge. May I encourage you to choose freedom. Let's all take one more deep breath.
now. Let go and let God. Thank you.